Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the next installment of Please Join Me. This is Joe Trena, and I'm delighted today to have a very special guest. She's essential to the musical theater, not like Addison DeWitt, in the totally opposite way. And uh, Mary, Mary Testa is with me. She's a three-time Tony Award nominee, and she's best known for playing Aunt Eller in the Broadway revival Oklahoma, also Madame Dilly in the revival of On the Town and Maggie in the revival of 42nd Street. I saw her on stage, I uh, was lucky enough years ago as Domina in A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. I worked there temporarily as the manager of the St. James Theater. And Mary has worked with numerous collaborators, all well known in the musical theater, William Finn, Michael John Lacusa, uh, Lorraine Hickok uh, is a role you played, is it not? Yes, it is. Okay. In a musical called First Lady Suite, Michael John Ray. For which you won uh, Anna Edson Taylor, the role you played in Queen of the Mist. You won a Drama Desk Award, correct? I did, yes. And you've had many numerous movie and television credits. including I have. Including the one that I enjoyed not long ago, Madame Drina on uh, Mrs. Maisel. Yeah, it was so much I fun. Thought, yeah, I had a great time I thought time that was doing a, a great comic turn. Anyhow, Thank you. thanks so much for making yourself available and joining us today. My I'm pleasure. to interview artists, uh, both of the world of music and theater, and hopefully some folks who are designers and photographers, and to essentially ask them how they're doing in times when, unfortunately, people in the arts community have been most severely hit by this pandemic. And people are trying to be creative about staying active and obviously looking forward to the future and maybe making some plans. So tell me, how are you doing right now, uh, you know, given the circumstances? I'm doing pretty good. I, um, it's, it's been, I'm starting to go a little stir crazy right now, but I, you know, I've been actually enjoying the break. Um, I'm very grateful that uh, Oklahoma closed last January because I feel like if we continued to March, um, we probably all would have gotten ill because of the the setup of the audience and and how we you know we it was like a horseshoe and people were just all face towards us and they were close. So I feel like we, it was a blessing to close January 19th before the you know great wave of it all hit. Um, so I'm doing well. I'm I'm done fair, a fair amount of Zoom readings and and things like that. A couple of like benefits where I recorded a song or stuff. But I'm actually um, enjoying the time off. It's getting a little bit tedious now <laughs> because every day seems to be kind of the same. But um, but I'm I'm not I'm not too crazy yet. I may be get I may get there in a few months, but. Right now, I'm good. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the Zoom readings, if you don't mind, and the benefits. Um, I've done about four or five Zoom readings of, of uh, plays. Um, uh, we did a, there was a show I did called The Government Inspector, which was great, a big success for um, the Red Bull Theater. We were, we were at the Duke Theater. This is a few years ago. And then we moved to uh, New World Stages. It was a very successful run. And so we just recently, a couple of months ago, did a, a revival reading of it, which was great fun. It was the original cast. It was everyone. Um, so that was good. I've done like three or four readings of new plays, um, which is interesting. I find the Zoom interesting. Um, it's, it's, of course, not optimal. You want to be able to look at people in the eye and work with people that way. But I find the Zoom thing is, is an interesting thing. I, I know that they've done... Um, uh, with Richard Nelson's plays, The Apple Family, they've done a lot of Zoom. They've done two plays in Zoom land, and it's interesting. So I don't hate it. Some people hate it. I don't hate it, but it's just a whole other sort of ball of wax. And then I've done a couple of singing things. I recorded a song for the civilian's benefit a while back, and, um, and, um, you know, with a with a pre existing track, which is kind of stressful, but um, but you know, I got it done, and so I've done stuff like that, and I've been asked to do stuff. You know, like they, people are trying to find things to do. You know, so they have this this 
I don't really know the company or the people that are putting it together, but this, this duets thing where they're doing duets with people. And I've got, been asked to do a duet with someone and I kind of just, I'm like, no, I'm good. I, I don't really, I don't really want to do it. But um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's not work 24 seven, but there's stuff going on. Okay. You're from Philadelphia. I was born there, yes, but I was raised in Rhode Island. Now, if I have this straight, you left school and came to New York to begin a career in acting? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how did that go for you in the beginning? Did you find that you, you, you hit it off immediately or, you know, did well, you? Well, I had met Bill Finn when I was in college. So uh -huh. when I moved to New York in 1976, I immediately started singing with him. And uh, one of his first shows called In Trousers happened in like 78, 79. Um, I had to work a job. I worked as a waiter, a cashier and a waiter in a restaurant. Uh, I worked a few restaurant jobs, but I had a great job at a place called the U.S. Steakhouse. Do you remember uh, that? It was in yeah. the Time Life building. Yep. Um, I was a waiter there for three years. And, um, uh, and also, you know, while I was working with Bill and doing other stuff and uh, I got this um, six week, uh, six week Stuart Ostro funded, um, how do I put it? It was a new musical review every week. There was a group of writers, a group, uh, two directors and a group of actors. And it was a six week thing and I got it and it was a hundred dollars a week. And I went to my manager at the US Steakhouse and I said, can I get a leave of absence to go and do this? And they didn't like me because I'm very vocal. And, you know, they were the managers of the restaurant were a little bit misogynistic. And they said, no, you can't get a leave of absence. So I said, OK, I quit. And my waiter friends helped me because they said, you didn't come here to be a waiter. You came here to be an actor. Right. And so I quit and I never had to get another job again. So there tell us go. about the first Broadway experience. My first Broadway experience was a show called Barnum in 1980. With Jim Dale. Um, I was, I'm sorry? Jim Dale? Yep, Jim Dale and Glenn Close, yeah. Um, I was hired two weeks before they opened as the swing for six roles and an understudy for the one black role in the show because it was a very low, it was a low-pitched song. Uh, it was um, that genius, oh my God, his name just escaped me. I see him before me, um, the writer of the music. Oh God. Cy Coleman. Like yeah. Coleman. He was wonderful. And, um, and I wasn't that happy about it because I was working on a Bill Finn show. I was working on a show called March of the Falsettos in, in workshop, but um, I was making $75 a week working on March of the Falsettos and Barnum was going to pay me $400 a week. This is 1980. And I knew that it was the first time that I ran across the art versus commerce um, sort of conundrum and i realized that i chose to be an actor i needed to pay bills so i took the broadway show even though i wasn't very happy about it and um i ended up uh being with that show for its entire run two years and i knew i um, performed pretty much every role in it several times and um i was the person that they hired to uh stage the first tour because i knew it better than anybody so go figure I wanted to ask about, uh, yeah, this is always interesting to me. I mean, this is not coming from an artistic standpoint at all, but, you know, I worked in the theater for 30 years and everything was on a clock, right? Huh? You, had to try, you had to try to get the production on a certain time. You had to try to get the actors on stage, the audience in, all of that. I also did a little TV and uh, as a... a background and I was a stand-in on a film and the tempo of course is wait 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 do you seen wait 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 and I wanted to ask you you know uh do you deal with that okay I mean it was such a different world to me uh as opposed to you know when when there are differences when you're yeah. alive and you are you know having to do it exactly at that time yeah I actually love all of the art forms you know I really I love doing television and film. Um, it is hurry up and wait. It is a lot of sitting around and waiting, but um, it's just a diff. That's what it is. You know, it's like that takes a long time for them to get lights and set just correct so that they can film. So I get that. 
Uh, it doesn't bother me that much, but I like, I like both stage and film and television because they're different ways of, of sort of acting, you know, a, a, a stage, you have to reach the back row and in film and television, you're just dealing with a camera. So um, I like all of that. Doesn't bother me in any way, shape or form. I like it. Tell me about some of your colleagues. Who do you like to work with? Who have you worked with in the past? Uh, you know, I work a lot with a lot of friends of mine and I love working yeah. with friends. Um, and I've worked with big stars as well. You know, as long as people are creative and, and artistic and collaborative, I love working with them. It's when people aren't collaborative and that hasn't happened to me that much, so. Well, who are your friends? When I work with Michael John Lacusa shows, uh, pretty much everybody involved is a friend. Um, and so like for Qu Queen of the Mist, everybody that was in that show, there were seven of us, they were all friends of mine. Uh, Andrew Samansky, Teresa McCarthy, Julia Murney, uh, Aunt, uh, Tally Sessions, DC Anderson, um, uh, Stanley Bohorek. Um, they're all friends. And so that it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience when you work with your friends because you're comfortable, you know, you can go out on a limb, you can be creative, you can try things. And, and these people will try it with you. You know what I mean? They'll go with you. It's, it's lovely. So I've been blessed. I'm just doing Oklahoma. I've been involved with Oklahoma for like five years. Um, so every single person on that stage uh, I've been with for a long time. So they're all friends now as well. And um, it was a glory, glory to do that show with them every night. Tell me about that. Because Nathan Lane, I believe, uh, at that time, also with the, uh, it kind of coincided with the premiere of The Birdcage. He really started to become a national name. And I, I worked with him a bit. And I think it was a bit of a long road for him to get to that place. Um, but you enjoyed working on that show. Did you not? It looked like a lot of fun. Nathan is an extraordinary um, craftsman. He, every second that he works, he is, uh, he is um, what's the word I'm looking for? He is refining and creating a character and he's always working always trying to find new things he's always spontaneous and he's always very funny um i give his uh professional uh career and and um demeanor a 10. Uh, he's wonderful as an actor wonderful yeah i i again i've seen a lot of his work i'm i'm delighted for his success you know okay i uh, want to ask beyond your career? Do you have a hobby? Do you like to spend time someplace? Uh, do, you, uh, do you do things to unwind, you know, when you're not acting? Yeah, you know, I've been, what I've been doing is um, I live in an apartment and I've been sort of refining my apartment and making, making it uh, comfortable and beautiful for me. I mean, I've lived here for a very long time, but I'm just doing little updates during this whole time, like changing light fixtures and putting in, uh, I put a bidet on my toilet, which is the best thing I've ever done. And, um, <laughs> and just like, you know, just new rug and new thing, little things, like nothing that's costing me a fortune, but just things that when I look at my apartment, it makes me very happy. So that's what I've been doing during this time. As far as hobbies go, it's hard to do the hobbies. I don't really have, I wouldn't call them hobbies, but you know, I love getting together with friends and going to listen to live music and stuff like that. A lot of that stuff's not happening right now. So um, so we have a lot of Zoom, uh, Zoom, or there's a, an app called Marco Polo, I don't know if you know about it, where I talk to a lot of friends um, that way, uh, we keep up to date on that, and um, as far as um, hobbies go, like I was thinking, I used to love to paint, and I painted a long time ago, and I was actually thinking about getting back into it, because there's nothing going on, so I may, I may do that, we'll see, um, that's it. That's about it. Has your family been supportive of your career? Yes, both my parents are gone, unfortunately, but they were very supportive of me. Um, they loved everything. They came to see everything and they were my biggest fans. And so my biggest fans are gone. But, um, uh, but I have a sister and a niece and, you know, and, I, and they are very supportive as well. And um, yeah, all good. I have an album that came out like four years ago. It's called Have Safe. It is with Michael Starobin and myself. Michael Starobin is a genius orchestrator, uh, yes. Tony winner. Yeah, great. 
he and I have always collaborated on shows. And this was based on a number of things we've done together and refined until we came up with a show called Have Faith. It is, uh, it's, I think it's, I'm very proud of the album. You can get it on Ghostlight or Amazon or um, um, I think those are the places you can get it. And as I said, it's called Have Faith. It's kind of all of a piece. It's all different covers and different, there's some original songs, there's covers, but it all makes sense as a big, as a whole, a concept album, which is um, not usually what happens these days. Um, so we're very, very proud of it. So that's something I can promote. Can you tell me please who accompanies you on the record? It's Michael Starobin and me. And uh, our cellist is a woman named Elisa Horn. So it's just the three of us. It's all, oh. it's a lot of electronic. Um, it, the, when the live show, we did a live show at 54 Below and the West Bank. Um, it was mostly all electronic and cello. But when we got to do the album and a friend of mine produced it, which was excellent because nobody really cares um, to produce, like the big people don't really care about, um, <laughs> didn't really care about the our show. But um, my friend produced it. We were able, Michael was able to uh, really orchestrate it with like gorgeous live players, uh, like a whole string section and uh, piano and um, cello, which was already there, and all kinds of gorgeous things. So it's it's really sumptuous. It's all Michael Starobin's arrangements and orchestrations. It's the two of our sort of collaboration and ideas of of each song, and I'm extremely proud of it. But it was like four years ago. But you could still buy it. Well, listen, they don't go stale. I have records no. that are over 20 years old. I like to think they've held up. Um, yeah. You want to talk about a couple of the tunes you recorded? Um, well, uh, there's a couple of uh, Michael John LaCusa songs. There's an original song called What If on it. Uh, there is um, an Aerosmith song call, um, uh, called Pink. There is, um, there is uh, an Annie Lennox song called um, uh, uh, We're Lost. There is um, uh, that great, gorgeous, the, the album closes with Hallelujah, which is like a great song. Uh, Leonard Cohen. Um, what else is on there? Um, there is a few, um, I don't know if you know this writer, um, Jill Sobule. There are two Jill Sobule songs on there. There is a Prince song on there, my favorite Prince song ever called Sometimes It Snows in April. Um, Michael Starobin wrote a song that he, he put to Sonnet 29, uh, Shakespeare Sonnet 29. So it's really a lot of different things, but they all make sense as a piece and um, it's pretty great if you ask me. Tracy died soon after a long fought civil war Just after I wiped away his last tear I guess he's better off than he was before A whole lot better off than the fools he left here I used to cry for Tracy cause he was my only friend those kinds of cars don't pass you every day I used to cry for Tracy cause I wanted to see him again But sometimes, sometimes life ain't always the way Sometimes it snows in April Sometimes I feel so bad, so bad Sometimes I wish that life was never ending And all good things they say never last Springtime was always my favorite time of year 
A time for lovers holding hands in the rain Now springtime only reminds me of Tracy's tears Always cried for love, never cried for pain He used to stay so strong, unafraid to die Unafraid of the dead that left me hypnotized Staring at his picture I realized No one could cry the way my Tracy cried Sometimes it snows in April Sometimes I feel so bad, so bad Sometimes I wish that life was never ending And all good things they say never last I often dream of heaven And I know that Tracy's there I know that he has found another friend Maybe he's found the answers to all the April snows Maybe one day I'll see my Tracy again Sometimes it snows in April Sometimes I feel so bad They say never last And all good things they say never last And love, it isn't love till it's past Once again, folks, buy Mary Testa's record have faith, an, yep. eclectic, an eclectic collection of wonderful yes. music, I'm sure yeah. brilliantly performed. So Thank uh, you. you can get a lot of music free out there, folks, but please buy some. These are very yeah. tough times for performing artists, and a lot of them are not making the livings that they would hope to make at this time. Uh, I want to thank you, Mary, for making yourself available today. And thank you it's, for asking. It's a delight to have you, and I, I wish you only the best in your future endeavors. And thank that, you, Joe. Same to you. And at some point, maybe you'll come back and visit us in the future. Absolutely. Why not? Thank you okay. very much. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. You've been listening to Please Join Me with Joe Trina. Be sure to listen anywhere you get your podcasts. Keep up with JoeTrainingMusic.com for news and new episodes. Be sure to look out for Joe's newest recording, Tip of the Hat, due out later this month on all streaming services and wherever fine music is sold. This episode was produced by Caroline Voigt.